Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, great to see you all, uh, a select body of fine people out at nine o'clock on a, a first Sunday after Easter, which I think in the church book is, what is it? It's the, the second Sunday of Easter or something like that. Anyway, there we are. Welcome and welcome to all of you who are on the screen or viewing or anything like that. In the Psalms, David wrote, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. And he could go on to say, refuge in times of trouble, refuge in confusing times. Times maybe that people had not experienced before. The grass withers, the flowers fall, said Isaiah, but the word of our God stands forever. And Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Let's begin our service. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us stand and sing the first of our hymns, which have been uh, carefully chosen for us by Pippa today, in the absence of our organist, who has actually returned, especially for this service, hot foot or hot plain from the land of Israel, along with Mark Ely as well. So we are doubly blessed to have visitors direct from the Holy Land. So let's rise to sing, Thine be the glory.
Let us pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus spoke these comfortable words. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us then confess our sins in penitence and in faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. So let us say together, Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned, thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and erect what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. And now the collect for today. <clears throat> Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our second hymn is an old one and a very good one. I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus. If you're not happy with the these, say I'm trusting you, Lord Jesus. It's the same number of syllables, so it's all right. But old-fashioned words, eternal message. Let's rise to sing this hymn.
Please sit down. Catherine's going to come and read the Bible to us, and then she'll pray for Pippa, who will bring us the message. Thank you. Today's reading comes from John's Gospel, chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Jesus appears to Thomas. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The purpose of John's Gospel. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Pray for Pippa. Father God, thank you so much for Pippa and all that she does for our church community. Thank you for the work that she's put into preparing this talk. Speak to us now through her, we pray, by your Holy Spirit, and show us how to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Catherine. Good morning, everybody. Lovely to see you. So, back to Easter Sunday evening. The disciples were locked away for fear of the Jewish authorities. And these Jewish authorities had had Jesus crucified. There was more than a possibility that they would come back for his close friends and followers. Let's just consider how they must have been feeling. Apart from that fear, they had the shame and the guilt of the previous Thursday evening when they'd abandoned Jesus. The horror and ghastliness of Good Friday. I mean, Good Friday can be quite gut-wrenching for us if we really think about it. And we know the end of the story, but they didn't. It had been unbelievably awful. The injustice, the extraordinary behaviour of the crowd, the calamitous way that everything had gone so wrong. They had watched him die. Then there was the lull, the nothingness, the anticlimax of Easter Saturday, the Sabbath, and the feelings of confusion 
about what the last three years of their lives have been about. And now, Jesus' body has disappeared. Mary Magdalene says she's seen him. She could have imagined it, or made a mistake, or it might have been a vision. But what does it all mean? And into this fear and confusion, Jesus suddenly appears. He's not a ghost. They can touch him and he can breathe. And we're told in Luke's gospel that he asked for something to eat. He shows them the nail marks in his hands and the hole in his side where the spear went in. So he's not a ghost and he's not an imposter. It's Jesus. It's really Jesus. It's impossible. It's impossible for him to get into a locked room. But more to the point, it's impossible for him to be alive when he was dead. But then, Jesus has been doing impossible things ever since the start of his ministry. Things like walking on water, calming storms with a word, raising people from the dead, feeding thousands of people with five bread rolls and two fish. It was Jesus who said in Mark chapter 10, verse 27, all things are possible for God. And Jesus' greeting to them is, peace be with you. No criticism, no chastisement for what's gone on before. And then later on, he said again, peace be with you, and added, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive their sins, they are not forgiven. So just as Jesus has brought God's kingdom to the Jews, the disciples are to take God's kingdom out to the rest of the world. It's the beginning of a new order. And by the way, when Jesus said, peace be with you, I don't think he meant they were in for an easy life. Jesus never said life would be easy. He said, take up your cross and follow me. The disciples needed the Holy Spirit. Not to give them exciting spiritual experiences, although they would have plenty, or to make them into some sort of holy elite, but so that they can do the things that Jesus has been doing. And by the way, people do not forgive sins. God forgives sins, but people are needed to announce his forgiveness. And also, people are needed to challenge, to rebuke, to warn other people that living in sin will result in death. But Thomas wasn't there. We don't know why. Maybe he preferred to grieve in private and to work through his feelings on his own. We know he loved Jesus. In John eleven sixteen, when Jesus had said he was going to Jerusalem, Thomas is the one who said, let us go too, so we might die with him. Thomas missed out on seeing Jesus. And when they told him, he didn't believe them. You see, a second-hand experience of meeting with Jesus is not the same as meeting him yourself. Thomas refused to say that he believed when he didn't. He was honest. 
and he wanted to be completely sure. To be fair, if the disciples were going to put their lives on the line to bring God's kingdom to the rest of the world, they needed to be sure. It's not just a case of mental assent, it's life-changing certainty that's needed. So, the following Sunday evening, the first day of the week, again, the disciples were all together in the same room, and Jesus appeared through the locked door again. He knew what Thomas had said, although nobody had told him, and he used Thomas's own words. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out and put your hand into my side. Jesus showed Thomas the evidence and said, stop doubting and believe. And then Thomas is the first person in the New Testament to address Jesus as my God. My Lord and my God, he said. Jesus had told them all several times that he was going to die and that he would be raised to life again in order to make a way for us all to be put right with God. I wonder if he was a bit disappointed that Thomas needed to see with his own eyes and touch with his own hands before he could believe. So, the new order has started. The disciples are taking on the mantle from Jesus bringing the gospel to the rest of the world. After Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came more fully in power, they became transformed from a bunch of terrified, defeated individuals to a committed and determined group of believers who confidently stood up to the leaders of Israel, refused to be stopped from preaching, were prepared to suffer for their faith, And when they became dispersed by persecution, they spread the gospel all over the world. The job is not complete, though. And we, as disciples of Christ, are supposed to be part of that team, acting in the power of the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel of the good news of Jesus and bringing the kingdom of God to our small corner of the world. How do we think it's going? I think that if you compare us with the disciples in the early chapters of the book of Acts, where we read of them healing people, preaching with confidence, being thrown into jail, being let out by angels in the night, being brought before the Sanhedrin and telling the high priest that they must obey God, not the Jewish authorities. It seems that in comparison, we have less of a sense of urgency and maybe less confidence than they did. Why do we think that is? They obviously have the advantage of seeing Jesus with their own eyes, both before and after he was crucified. But then we have the advantage of having the New Testament written down, which they didn't. We need to read it and make sure we know what it says. I think there may be several things that are causing our lack of confidence. I'm just going to touch on a few this morning. Firstly, discipleship is about learning. We need to be confident in our knowledge of Jesus and in what he has said and what he has done. We do this, as I've just said, by reading the Bible, but also by listening to people who are good at explaining it. It's not just knowing about Jesus that's important, though. It's knowing him. It's having a personal relationship with him, spending time with him in prayer listening to him. Secondly, we need the Holy Spirit, who Jesus said in John 16, verse 13, 
will lead us into all truth. I think maybe some of us are not quite sure how much we trust the Holy Spirit. But Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit as the comforter and as the one who would help us to remember what Jesus had said and also as the one who would enable us to be like Jesus by being Jesus inside us. In Romans chapter 12, we are told that the Holy Spirit gives all of us different gifts. Things like teaching, serving, prophesying, encouraging, giving, leading, showing mercy. In Galatians 5, we're told that the fruit or the evidence of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. None of these things sound too scary, do they? Let's not presume that we can manage without the Holy Spirit because Jesus said that the disciples needed him and that we need him too. The other thing I need to talk about is doubt. Doubt is not necessarily a bad thing if it causes us to seek out the truth and to remember what God has said and done by searching the scriptures, by reflecting on past experience, by learning from others. But doubt can be a bad thing if it turns into unwillingness to look carefully at the evidence and choosing to disbelieve. Jesus showed Thomas the evidence and said, stop doubting and believe. It is quite normal to go through doubt, especially when we haven't heard God speaking for a long time or when we've had difficult times to go through and when the world's in such a mess as it is. But rather than letting doubt overcome us, we need to look at the evidence, the evidence in the Bible, to read the promises of God, to look at the way the disciples changed from terrified, uneducated people to apostles and teachers full of confidence and authority from the Holy Spirit, ready to put their lives on the line and die for what they believed and had seen. Then there's the evidence of people today people being changed, people being healed, prophecies coming true, lives being turned around. Then there's the evidence in our own lives, things we have seen God do, times in our lives when it's definitely been God. There are a few occasions in my life when I've heard God speak audibly in words. And then he's answered my prayer. I am utterly convinced that it was God because of the evidence. And these are the times that I think back to when I'm troubled by doubt. I'll tell you a couple of them. I'm sorry if you've heard these before. One of them was a few years ago when I was really upset about something that had happened, which I felt was very unfair. I was in tears and complaining to God. And I went out to post a letter, and as I was walking along the road, I heard a voice. It was in my head, but it was clear and audible. And it said, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. I said to God, if that's you, show me where those words come from because I recognized it as a Bible verse, but I'm a bit rubbish at remembering references, so I couldn't remember where it was from. 
I didn't hear anything else. But a few minutes later, I got back home, and to my surprise, I found Robert, my husband, sitting on the sofa, reading the Bible. Not that that's a, an unusual thing, <laughs> but he wasn't, he wasn't sitting there reading it when I went out a few minutes earlier, and it would be no, more normal to see him read it at the beginning or the end of the day. So I asked him what he was reading, and he said, Jeremiah chapter 29. And as some of you have already tweaked, that is where it says in verse 11, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now the significance of that is that if I'd picked up a Bible that day and read the, those verses, with my head full of my own problems, I would have thought, oh yeah, God's giving promises to the Israelites, that's nice, and thought no more about it. But because that verse pinged into my head and God provided the answer to my question in a very short space of time, that feels very much like God speaking to me. There's another occasion when I'm absolutely sure I saw God working for me. It was a while ago. When I was a student in Liverpool, I borrowed my dad's car for a bit. And while I had it, it developed an electrical fault. And in those days, cars had fuses. And it blew the fuse, which meant that all the lights went out, including brake lights and indicators and everything. And the wipers wouldn't go. Uh, and the horn wouldn't work, but the car would still go. So I phoned my dad, like you do, and he said, don't go to a garage in Liverpool, they'll see you coming a mile off. <laughs> Change the fuse and bring the car home at the weekend. So I changed the fuse and it worked all right for a bit, but then it blew again. So I went to the local garage and I bought up all the spare fuses that they had. <laughs> and gradually, during the week, I went through them one by one as they kept blowing. Till on Thursday afternoon, I was down to the very last one. I was hoping and praying desperately that it would last till I got home because I didn't think it was a very good idea to drive down the motorway on a Friday night with no indicators, no brake lights, no wipers. It always rains in Liverpool. But it didn't last. It went. I was devastated. I was so angry and upset with God, and I told him so. And while I was praying and complaining and sobbing, I clearly heard a voice out of nowhere, saying, what would you like me to do for you? And I didn't know if it was God or not, so I just said, well, you could change, you, you could mend the fuse. I should have said, can you change it into a limo that works? But <laughs> anyway, that's what I said, end of. A little while later, my, friend's, my flatmate's boyfriend came round, and because he was a bloke, I said, would you mind looking at the car and just seeing if you can spot anything that's obviously making the fuses blow? So he looked at the car, he took out the fuse, he said, this isn't broken, and it wasn't. And he put it back in, and it worked, and it carried on working, all the way down the M6, all the way down the M5, all the way down the A46, all the way down the A36 out to Limpley Stoke, into my parents' gateway, and it blew. All the lights went up. God is amazing. I find it totally mind-blowing that he would take the time to sort out my problem when he's got the whole universe to worry about. So if I feel doubt coming on, 
I think back to incidents like these. And maybe you've got incidents, similar incidents in your life, or some, some that you've heard of from other people. And then also we can look at the way the disciples were transformed and the promises of God. And when I think of these things, my doubts fade away. And I feel absolutely certain that what Jesus said is true. He has made a way for us to be put right with God. I'm not pretending I've got everything sorted, though. I am still very much a work in progress. You know, we really need each other. We need to remind each other of these things. That's why we have a church family, so that when one person is feeling down, some others are feeling strong and can pull them up and support them. Meeting together is so important for building each other up, for sharing testimony, for supporting one another, for encouraging those who are going through times of doubt and other difficulties. As Hebrews 10 verse 25 says, let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. Shall we pray? Father God, thank you so much that you raised Jesus from death so that we can be forgiven and made right with you. Please will you help us to trust in your promises and to believe the evidence in the New Testament and all around us. Please will you send your Holy Spirit on this church right now and allow your, help us to allow your Spirit to fill us and to make us more like Jesus. Give us confidence and give us power so that we can be the people you want us to be and do the things you want us to do. And may your kingdom come in Western. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Pippa, thank you very, very much indeed. I think that will stay with us for a very long time. When I think of the number of times I've blown a fuse over some sort of trivia and it's had to be repaired... I hope it's not too flippant to say that I looked up at the, towards the end of Pippa's talk and I saw the banner just up there, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And in my silly little mind, I replaced the love with an everlasting fuse. Praise the Lord. We're going to stand up and sing a fabulous hymn. I will sing the wondrous story well, you know how it goes on. So let's stand and sing it. <clears throat>
let us stand, remain standing, and say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now Mark's going to come up and lead us in our prayers, so please sit down. Hi. Uh, I've returned from Israel with a bit of a cough and a cold. Nothing serious, but um, bear with me if I start to cough. And at the end of my prayers, we will finish by saying together the Lord's Prayer. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. O oh, my soul, rejoice. Lord, we come to worship you this morning and to give you our praise to humble ourselves and bring to you our needs, the needs of our community in this world, which you created and sent your son Jesus to die for. We ask for your resurrection spirit to inhabit our, inhabit our bodies, that we might live with boldness the resurrection life, to be witnesses to our families, our friends, our colleagues, workmates, and all that we meet. May your love live in us and overflow in our lives. Lord, comfort those who worship you in sadness for the loss of a loved one. We think of Lynn Ward, whose mother Sylvia died recently, and also for Mike and Judy Everson, whose daughter died. We also remember Graham Turner, who you called to be with you this week. Comfort his wife Anne and their two sons who mourn his leaving. We thank you for his life and the lives of other saints who have faithfully served you in this church family. Comfort and heal the sick of our church family. And we thank you for Judith Leach's great improvement in her health and ask that you bless her and her husband John and her family. Lord God, King of heaven and earth, we seek your intervention in Ukraine and this horrible, violent, sad war where innocent people are suffering and dying under the bombs and missiles of the Russian army. Intervene, Lord, and bring about a peaceful resolution where a hopeless situation exists. Change the hearts of politicians, military leaders, and soldiers turn, to turn away from violence and turn to you in repentance and in faith. Give wisdom and unity to our government and to all governments around the world to clearly see and recognize 
the wrongful suffering being endured by the Ukrainian people. Bless and support our church family at this time of interregnum. Help the staff team who have taken on extra duties and responsibilities, and especially our church wardens, Paddy, Peter Ward, Gerald, and Peter Stoneley, all who have been working hard for some time now. Help them in this work and the team responsible for appointing a new church leader here at All Saints. May the right person see, uh, sorry, may the right person see and respond to the advert posted. Grant good judgment and insight to the team to recognize the leadership skills and abilities needed in that person to lead our community. And finally, Lord, bless our local community and the city of Bath. Bless us and all the churches and Christians in this city to enable us to be servants in your name to those who do not know you, to be strong and courageous as you have commanded. Give us your love and strength to take this land with your gospel as you gave Joshua and your people the strength and courage to enter and take the promised land in the name of the one and only living God. And we ask all these things in the name of our risen and living Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you very much, Mark. Our final hymn is Christ Triumphant, Ever Reigning. So let's stand to sing this.
And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen, and have a great week.